Hey, what's going on YouTube? Uh, so I just want to bring you guys a real quick video today. Uh, there was some uh, leaks recently um, about Ryzen's new R3 processors coming to market very soon and pricing regarding those processors. Obviously on this screen here you guys can see I have the uh, leaks from WCCF Tech, uh, WCCF Tech up and uh, they basically allege that the pricing for the new uh, R3 1200 and the 1300X, both quad core parts, uh, no SMT enabled, so they're just uh, four cores, four threads, but those are both unlocked and the base frequencies and you know, boost you can see here on the 1200, you've got 3.1 base, 3.4 gigahertz uh, boost clock, and the 16, I'm sorry, the 1300X is a 3.5 gigahertz base with a 3.7 gigahertz boost. Both of which, of course, like I say, are fully unlocked. So if you want to overclock the processors, you certainly can do that. Uh, memory you can overclock on, you know, the B350 chipset for AM4, as well as the X370 chipset for AM4. Um, and again, you've got your roadmap for the next, you know, three, four, five years with AMD. Uh, if you get one of these CPUs today, doesn't mean you can't pop in a six core or an eight core R5 or an R7 in a few months or whenever you like. They're available now. Uh, or, of course, you can pop in, you know, a brand new Zen 2 or Zen 3 core, 7 nanometer, better IPC, better efficiency, um, and even better processors in the future into that same socket. So um, what's really outstanding, what really is kicking Intel right, you know, in the, uh, right in the area they don't want to be kicked in is the pricing. And, you know, relative to what you can get for Intel for the money, AMD is just destroying them across the board. And I'm going to cover this. I'm also going to cover real quick some news about Threadripper pricing, which again is available on this website. I love these guys. WCCF Tech, they do get some stuff wrong. We all do. But for the most part, it's a solid site to look at if you guys want to see you know, what's coming down the line, what's going on with pricing and rumor mill, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that with technology. So um, I just want to show you guys, these are rumored, the uh, R3 1200. Um, again, quad core part unlocked, rumored to be coming in at $109. Um, the R3 1300X quad core part, a little bit higher based, uh, base and boost frequency. Um, I think the X, you know, will enable a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit greater headroom there for XFR to operate, uh, which is just their extended frequency range. If you have better cooling, it'll kind of automatically boost up, you know, a single core um, when you're doing, you know, lightly threaded workloads. But I just want to show you guys the current kind of market for, and you can go on Newegg and just do what I'm doing right now and see for yourselves, but for $109, you've got a, a dual core KB Lake part, uh, you know, 3.6 gigahertz, no, no boost on that, no hyperthreading enabled on that. So it's, this is literally a vanilla dual core part for 105 bucks is what you're going to get. Uh, on Socket 1151 from Intel today. And that, as I said in the past, is basically a dead-end platform. Socket 1151, um, even if you have a brand new Z270 board, they're not going to be any chips. At least Intel has not disclosed any information as far as a roadmap goes for Socket 1151, you know, introducing, you know, uh, better chips with more cores, more threads down the line, etc. And they really have kind of clumped, in my opinion, you know, their mainstream consumers have kind of been forced on to their new X299 uh, Socket 2066 platform. And really, you know, if you get a, a KB Lake X part, um, you know, as opposed to a Skylake X part on that platform, you're really neutering yourself in terms of what that platform is capable of. And Intel, again, is just kind of corralling people um, into a higher cost, another new platform, and, and penalizing people for spending less money and AMD, even if you buy an R3 processor, you're still going to have all the future expandability and the full capability of the AM4 platform. And the same goes for Threadripper here, which I'll show you in a little bit. But again, pricing on these, uh, the next one up is 120 bucks. You get into Intel's uh, base uh, i3 model right now. And so for $119, $10 more than the uh, R3 1200, I believe it is, um, you do get... Um, hyper threading on this chip 
It's a dual core processor, um, but it's hyper-threading enabled, so you get four threads, but it's not unlocked. You've got a 3.7 gigahertz, um, you know, flat, flat um, clock speed. I don't believe there's any boosting on this chip. I could be wrong, but um, let's see here real quick. No, there is no, there's no boosting on this chip. So 3.7 gigahertz is what you get out of the box. You cannot overclock that. You cannot overclock your memory um, with that platform or that chip. Pardon me. And, um, you know, it's $10 more than the um, R3-1200, which is a true quad-core part and fully unlocked, fully enabled with a, with a, with a you know, a, a big um, or at least highly visible upgrade path for the long term. So that really is hurting Intel there. For $10 more, you can get yourself into the R3-1300X. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable overclocking yourself, it's got a, you know, a, a, a good boost to the base clock, 3.5 gigahertz, uh, 3.7 gigahertz boost clock. Again, you're going to have XFR enabled as well. So if you have better cooling, it'll even go above that on all four actual physical cores. Um, and again, you've got that roadmap ahead of you. The closest thing we see here on the Intel side is you have a, uh, like a, a kind of a semi-neutered, uh, i3 6100T uh, for 125 bucks. Uh, the T just means it's like a lower TDP, lower power consumption, and they lower the clock speed to get that. But again, it's only a dual core, two, two physical core part. Um, Hyperthreading is enabled on this, but there's no boost clock. And this is at 3.2 gigahertz on a platform that, in my opinion, is dying or, or dead at this point. So you've got um, 125, 126 bucks for this part, uh, or and this is on sale, for 140 bucks, you can get an unlocked dual core i3. This is the first one that will have, um, you know, the ability to overclock on your own if you want. And it has a good clock speed out of the gate, uh, 4.2 gigahertz. So, you know, if you're running a lot of, you know, single or only dual core applications, I don't know who's doing that now, but... Um, uh, you know, that'd be a great CPU if you just wanted to, let's say, you know, mine uh, bitcoins or something like that, and you wanted a low power part. Actually, that T part would be even better um, if you wanted to mine stuff. It has really low power consumption. But um, other than that, you know, these parts are now irrelevant. So uh, you've got your dual core hyperthreaded parts on, on Intel uh, on a dead platform, and you've got these new R3 models coming out for Ryzen from AMD. You know, again, on a fully enabled AM4 platform with a lot of longevity left in it for years and years to come in terms of expandability um, and being able to upgrade your platform and advantages today from having four physical physical cores uh, versus, you know, dual core parts with hyper-threading enabled, which kind of, again, you know, you've got four logical cores there, but essentially hyper-threading and even SMT from, from AMD, um, simultaneous multi-threading, those essentially are just kind of uh, filling in the spaces. It's almost like uh, uh, on a GPU where you've got a synchronous compute. Um, they, they find little gaps in utilization and they run other processes on those, on those, uh, those cores, you know, th those threads, etc. So they're not true, you know, logical, physical, physical cores and um, they just don't, they don't, you know, act the same way. So um, this is really going to be, you know, impacting Intel in terms of market share. We've already seen AMD gain a ton of market share over the past couple of months just by releasing their mainstream R5 and R7 CPUs into the market. Um, and now they're going to release uh, very soon here the R3 parts and really take, a, you know, take it to Intel in the low end of the market all the way up through... Um, you know, the high-end mainstream consumer market. I did see some, um, some aggressive pricing by Intel recently on their Core i7 7700K. I think it was like 304, 305 bucks on sale temporarily. Uh, at the same time, and for the next five days, I believe, you guys can go on Newegg right now and get yourself uh, a chip that has double the cores, double the threads, is fully unlocked. The one I have in my system right now, the 1700, the R7 1700, for like 200 and like 59, 260 bucks, which is absolutely insane in terms of value. Uh, this processor eats every single application. Uh, it is highly threaded as you want it. 
for lunch. Uh, again, you have a, an, a, you know, an absolutely fantastic upgrade path uh, and a viable future on that platform. So Intel is trying to compete in price, uh, but AMD is just gobbling up market share and they're taking it to Intel um, you know, and, and providing value to us, the end user, the consumer, in, in the mainstream market, all the way from the low end of the mainstream to the high end of the mainstream. And what I want to show you guys next is the introduction. Obviously, Intel's already introduced into the market uh, Socket 2066 X299 uh, with KB Lake X and, uh, and Sky Lake X up to 10 cores, 20 threads, which is really, I think, all they had intended for maybe a 12 core, 24 thread part. Uh, Intel had intended for before seeing the imminent release, um, you know, or the news that AMD was going to release this new Threadripper platform with up to 16 cores, 32 threads, and uh, rumors, you guys can go on here again and see the same thing. Uh, they've got the 10 core, uh, well, uh, yeah, the AMD uh, basically right now is showing a live demonstration between um, Intel's highest end, at least currently available, 10 core, 20 thread, uh, 7900X, which if you look right now, it costs 1200 bucks, it's not even available. But um, this chip, they actually pit against uh, an Intel Threadripper 1920X, which they say will cost a mere uh, $799, 800 bucks. So $400 less, you're getting uh, two more physical cores. You're getting 12 cores and 24 threads versus, you know, the 7900X's uh, 10 cores and 20 threads. For, again, for $400 less. Um, and they've doing, they're doing live demonstrations showing the, uh, the you know, Cinebench 15 uh, performance on these chips. And it's just absolutely crazy how well these things scale, at least in this application. You know, real-world applications will have to see... Uh, but in terms of just how these perform uh, in this one benchmark application, things look very, very good. Um, and they're saying that you're, you're getting roughly 40% better um, performance per dollar with Threadripper uh, utilizing the 1920X. Uh, and they do show also the 1950X, which is AMD's highest end part. That's their 16 core, 32 thread part. Uh, both of these, I think, have... Um, you know, uh, base frequencies around three and a half gigahertz and boost up to four gigahertz, uh, and that's without XFR. So XFR again will take that over for four gigahertz, you know, on a single thread um, if your cooling is sufficient, and that's without any overclocking, of course, you know, on your, you know, your, uh, you have to do whatsoever. But if you want to overclock uh, all these CPUs, and to be fair, the Intel CPUs and the entire, you know, um, uh, X299 uh, platform are going to be overclockable as well. But, um, you know, for the money, AMD is saying they're going to release their 16 core 32 thread part for a thousand bucks. And, you know, Intel's parts that have 12 cores, 14, uh, 16, and 18 cores aren't even due out until September, as far as I know. And pricing on those we've already seen is going to go all the way up to $2,000. Um, for that 18 core part, I believe the 16 core part, you know, will cost about $600 more than the equivalent, you know, in terms of core and thread count AMD, uh, AMD part. And I just don't see them being able to compete uh, in terms of performance per dollar, in terms of value to the consumer. They're going to get absolutely smashed all the way from the low end mainstream, um, you know, through the high-end desktop, the highest high-end desktop offering that they have, and uh, they're going to continue to lose market share. They're going to continue to lose market share to AMD um, on the personal computing side of things, and they've yet to release mobile. Um, there was some news. Well, I, I, first, I just want to say I'm super excited about AMD's mobile offering is coming up. Um, you know, right now to get a quad-core eight-thread part from Intel. We really have to look at one of these larger form factor, almost gaming laptops to be able to handle the heat, uh, dissipate the heat created by those Intel chips, the mobile chips. And AMD has shown not only a uh, quad core eight thread part. If you guys watched the Computex video I did recently where I just kind of edited out and made a quick, you know, Computex, basically like a, an abridged ver version of what they showed at Computex. 
you'll see them demonstrating uh, an eight core, no, I'm sorry, an eight thread, four core, uh, you know, Zen base uh, APU. And being an APU, it also has integrated Vega graphics cores in it. And that was in a sub 15 millimeter form factor two in one laptop, which um, is going to be absolutely insane. You know, getting the performance of, of, a, of a quad core eight thread Zen base CPU with Vega graphics cores in something like a Surface Pro style, you know, or, 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 or form factor and something that small um, is going to be absolutely a crushing blow regardless of price uh, to the mobile market for Intel because they cannot do that right now. There's not sufficient cooling. Those chips that they have create too much heat. They need um, to be dissipated by bigger fans, bigger cooling solutions. Again, most of those quad core parts that I've seen um, reside in gaming laptops that are you could you know you could hit a, hit a camel over the head and kill it with, and AMD is going to have a quad core part with eight threads and Vega graphics and a sub 15 millimeter form factor, um, and they're probably going to beat up Intel on price and that market as well. So, uh, you know, um, I, I really think as far as we are concerned, general consumers are concerned. Over the next six months, you're going to see Intel getting beaten over the head. I'm talking absolutely lying on the ground, bleeding. Somebody please call 911 for me kind of beating they're going to take um, with regard to the mainstream consumer market all the way from mobile, the low end mainstream to the high end desktop, the highest of the high end desktop platform. Um, one other thing I do want to mention here real quick. I know this is kind of jumbled together. I only have so much time to do this stuff. And again, I can't look at the screens all that much. So I apologize for the, uh, you know, haphazard nature of this video. But I do want to get you guys some information. And it's available online again. But I just want to consolidate it here for you real quick. Um, Intel hasn't actually responded. Uh, and I think this is hilarious. And there is some merit to some of the stuff they're saying. But if you guys want to go on and read this article, again, uh, WCCF Tech has them available. Go on there and I'll try and get you guys the links below as, uh, as well in the description below. But um, they've responded to the greatest threat that they have. And the greatest threat that, threat that AMD right now is posing to Intel, um, even though they're going to be losing market share, like I say, hand over fist, and they are, uh, to the mainstream consumers, to us, they do not want to lose the battle um, of, of the enterprise market. They do not want to lose in the data center. Intel has come out. They've had not just one individual. They've had teams of people picking apart uh, and dissecting and doing all kinds of tests um, to try and show anything uh, to downplay really the, the, uh, the performance and the value, the... Uh, uh, the compatibility with, with current uh, virtualization technology in terms of being able to port over virtual machines in the server market. I know a lot of stuff doesn't apply to you guys in particular. Um, but I think it's hilarious that Intel is now on the defense, on the defensive. They are, they are now providing FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If any of you guys have ever been in sales, they are trying to FUD the hell out of the new um, Naples CPUs, the SP3 socket, you know, from AMD, the Epic platform or Epic CPUs that they're going to have, you know, available for the enterprise market. And, um, you know, uh, Intel has gone so far as to have, and you can look on here, they've got so much trash talking uh, about, you know, uh, all these AMD, you know, new Epic CPUs are, are essentially just glued together you know, um, versions of their consumer-based CPUs, which is completely true. Um, and again, I talked about this in my last video. It's modularity. AMD has created a platform with Zen that is fully modular all the way from even embedded low power solutions that scales all the way up to the enterprise and data center markets. And, you know, Intel is doing the best they can to try and try and FUD and try and, and show that you know, there's there's latency. Um, that you know, uh, these things are glued together, and that 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 Infinity Fabric interconnect um, isn't as efficient as just having, uh, you know, 28 cores. I think is what Intel is going to max out at with their you know uh, uh, their their new server you know line of CPUs. 
um, but basically they're on a single die. There's no interconnect there. Um, you're just getting 28 cores, 50, 56 threads uh, that, that do have access, you know, relatively the same latency, you know, to the L1, L2, L3 cache. Whereas on the, you know, Naples CPUs, which again are essentially just, um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with what Intel is saying about glued together, um, you know, consumer-based CPUs. It's, it's a fairly accurate statement. They really are. They're, they're, they're designed in a fashion where they're supposed to be modular um, and they can connect as many as they want AMD can and provide as many cores and threads as you want. Um, but I, I just think that Intel is, is running scared at this point. I think that AMD has them on the defensive so badly that, that they really can't even do anything about it in the mainstream market. I don't think they're going to be able to do anything about it at all in the mobile market. And I do think that Intel has some, some viable defensive position in the enterprise um, with things like Optane, which um, I actually just got this for kicks. But I'm going to try and get this uh, little Optane memory module up and running um, on the AM4 platform back here. So uh, look forward to that. If I can't do it, I'll tell you guys. But um, there shouldn't be anything holding me back from using this in my uh, M.2 slot using PCI Express 3.0, 4X or whatever. Um, and I just want to just, you know, do this for kick for you, kick, kicks for you guys. But in the mainstream consumer market, Optane right now really is irrelevant. It's just, it's just something that they're, they're, they are, uh, you know, trying to cling to in terms of proprietary technology to, just to say that we have any kind of differentiator other than you know, providing customers with half the cores and half the threads at higher cost and a dead platform, uh, we got Optane. So um, I wanna show you guys that you can run this on an AMD platform um, and that right now it really is not relevant for mainstream consumers. But in the enterprise, um, I have a lot of friends. I look, again, I live in Tampa, Florida, and there are large distribution centers here uh, that distribute you know, to huge companies, Amazon and, and, and Google. Um, you know, companies that use a lot of infrastructure in a data center. And I'm gonna ask these guys, you know, is how viable is it? I've got friends that work for EMC. I have friends that work for, uh, you know, value-added resellers in the area as well. How, how available uh, really is this Optane memory right now? Um, you know, what's the availability we're gonna see for data center customers in the near future? Is it a differentiator that will, that will matter in the enterprise? Um, and I'll let you guys know about that in the next video that I get a chance to update you on. But um, I think they have, you know, uh, a different differentiator, uh, at least a decent differentiator there, uh, providing kind of an intermediary memory between, uh, you know, your system RAM and your your uh, your NAND-based storage solutions. Um, but Intel has them, you know, um, also they're going to have higher prices. They're only going to have six-channel memory support, where AMD is going to have eight-channel memory support for server platform. Um, you know, they're going to be able to address more memory on AMD's, you know, uh, dual socket, um, you know, platform relative to Intel's and PCI Express lanes. Again, you know, Intel is trying to FUD that saying they can't really support the full bandwidth of PCI Express, um, even though they do have 128 lanes on those 32 uh, core 64 thread Naples CPUs coming out from AMD here very soon. Um, and there, there may be some, some merit to that argument. Uh, again, Intel has really dissected this, and they're just trying to show, um, again, that, you know, they're trying to hope upon hope that, that, that their enterprise customers don't leave them for AMD. Um, and that really is a market where you're talking about CPUs that cost exponentially, you know, orders of magnitude more than consumer grade CPUs cost. So Intel really does not want to lose that money. And, um, you know, again, I think it's going to be determined on the viability of a 3D X point, you know, you know, can consumers, or not consumers, well, uh, you know, enterprise consumers, enterprise customers even get their hands on enough of that memory to make a difference on those platforms. Um, you know, is that going to negate, you know, the, the, the difference between, you know, Intel offering six channel memory versus uh, AMD having available, you know, uh, eight channels of DDR4 on their Epic platform? Um, 
you know, I also think that expandability is, is something, you know, future-proofing is something that, that, that enterprise customers are interested in as well. Nobody wants to install an entire data center, uh, you know, full, full of product from Intel only to have to rip all of those racks out, replace all the motherboards in the next year and upgrade to an entirely new platform again, whereas AMD, uh, once again, is showing that they have got planned you can throw our new chips for the next four or five years into this same socket and get even better design, better efficiency, uh, better performance, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, in closing, guys, I know I'm beating a dead horse here and talking about how AMD is just killing killing, AM, uh, killing Intel in terms of value, but now, the, now you're seeing it. Now you're seeing it um, coming to the low end of the mainstream market. You're seeing it come to the very, very highest end of the high-end desktop market, um, you know, with our new X399, uh, you know, uh, uh, chipset and platform for high-end desktop consumers with Threadripper CPUs, and um, you're gonna see that in the mobile space. And again, there's not a whole lot that Intel can do um, other than cut prices and pray that, you know, that the bleeding stops. Um, I don't see that happening, I see AMD uh, you know, at least as far as we, the vast majority of mainstream consumers are concerned over the next six months, uh, getting, getting their asses handed to them um, and getting their market share taken away hand over fist, uh, again, from mobile, low end, uh, you know, all the way to the high end desktops. And, and the data center is yet to be seen. But I do, I do think it's funny how Intel is on the defensive now, even before the release of Epic. And they're trying to add fear, uncertainty, and doubt into the minds of their enterprise customers so that they don't get left by everyone. Uh, and that's going to be a challenge for them. So this is just a quick uh, recap of kind of what's going on right now in the CPU market. I hope you guys are all doing awesome out there. Um, I do want to do a video, maybe do one later today, uh, about the uh, Xbox One X and how I think you know the, the mainstream media is really missing the point of that box, uh, missing the, the gap in technology and the overall experience the end user is going to get uh, relative to its closest competitor, the PlayStation 4 Pro. Um, and I'm gonna try and touch on that in a brief history of uh, PlayStation versus Xbox and kind of how we've had parity for the last uh, you know almost 10 years, at least in terms of uh, graphical settings, et cetera, um, and the overall media experience uh, and how we're not going to have parity at all, no chance for parity uh, between the Xbox One X and the PlayStation 4 Pro. So uh, look forward to that coverage. I know a lot of you guys are PC guys, but I will talk a little bit about PC stuff in that, in that uh, video as well. And again, I'm gonna try and get this memory, this Optane memory, this proprietary technology running on my AM4 platform back here uh, as soon as possible, let you guys know how that goes. Other than that, hope you guys are doing awesome. Hope you guys are having a, uh, well, at least a, a, great, a great Friday. And if not, have a phenomenal weekend. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.